We're going to be in the fifth chapter of Matthew today. Roland Hayes got off to a hard start of life. He was one of three children born to a black family who lived in Georgia. When he was about five years old, the family moved to Tennessee. They were cotton farmers. They had a 15-acre cotton farm, and that's how they were trying to eke out a living. When he was 11 years old, his dad was trying to prune a tree. A limb fell, and he was killed. Mom did everything she could to train those three boys to be good boys, to work hard, to keep the farm going. But she realized these boys don't have a chance unless they get an education. She thought, we got to move away from this farm. She said, boys, we're going to pack up. We're going to move to Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was 62 miles away. So they loaded up the wagon. They hitched up the one horse they had. Mom drove the wagon, and the three boys walked barefooted for 62 miles as they moved to Chattanooga. When they got to Chattanooga, Mom helped start a church there. She started a choir. The church grew. They got a choir director, and one day he heard the choir director playing a phonograph, and he heard some popular recording artist of the day, and it just inspired him. And he realized in those moments he was thinking God has called him to be a professional musician. Back in those days, it was hard for a black person to make a living as a professional musician but his mom was going to do everything to support him. Even though he'd only made it through the fourth grade, somehow he got a scholarship to Fisk University, and he went to school there. But while he was in school, he wanted to pursue this music. He felt called by God to do it. He thought, first thing I got to do is make a name for myself. And it just got in his spirit that he needed to move to Boston. So he packed his mom up, took her with him, to Boston, the other brothers were able to take care of themselves. He moved to Boston, and he started trying to find somebody to sponsor him. Fabulous singer, really good voice. They tried to find somebody to sponsor him. They couldn't find anybody. He was about at his wit's end, and he thought, okay, God, I really need your help. This idea came to him. He got a list of the wealthiest people in Boston— he wrote a letter introducing himself as one of the future superstars of music. Ticket prices were $1.50, which was a whole lot, and it was in the biggest theater for musical performances in Boston. He sent it out. It worked. He sold out at $1.50 a ticket. He made about $2,000 from that. Now he's got money. He's thinking, this is so good. He'd finished the concert. A music critic talked to him and said, listen, I've heard a lot of singers. This is my business. I listen to people all the time. But there's something about you that's just different. What is it? He said, I really don't know. But he got to thinking. And he remembered the days after his father had died, he'd be in the cotton field with his uncle, his father's brother. And they'd been hoeing cotton all day. And his uncle used to talk to him about before he and this boy's father were came to the United States of America, their parents had been brought over as slaves. But before they were slaves here, they had been chiefs. They had a long life of chiefs in his family. He was a descendant of those chiefs. And he thought, I got to go to Africa and find my tribe and find out about my culture. So he's got all this money. He starts the journey toward Africa. He made it as far as London, and he started running out of money. And when he got to London, he went to church there. He found favor with them. They let him sing for them, and it just so happened that when he sang in church that day, he was so good that the king and the queen of England, who happened to be in church that day, heard him. They invited him to come sing at Buckingham Palace. Now he's got a track record. He's getting some traction. He's been at the biggest performance hall in Boston. He's been in this huge church in London. Now he's sung for Buckingham Palace. He gets an invitation to the Beethoven Concert Hall in Berlin. So he starts to head that way. 
while he's in Prague, he stops by an embassy. He gets to know the people there. They hear what he's doing. A few days later, they track him down. They said, listen, you better not go to Berlin. A war has broken out between the French and the Germans. And the French are holding their ground because an American group of soldiers who are all black have drawn the line and the Germans can't cross it. So right now, it's not a good time for a black American to be in Berlin. They said, you should not go through with the concert. He prayed about it. He thought about it. He thought, got to do this. Just got to do it. So he and his black piano player went to the back of the theater the night of the concert. They came in quietly. They entered. They got situated on the stage. There's a big grand piano. He was standing in the curve of the piano, had on his tuxedo, was ready to sing. The curtain goes up. And when they see that it's a black man, they start to hiss. And then they start to boo. And then they start to stomp their feet. And then they start throwing things on the stage at him. He's praying hard. He said, oh, God, what am I supposed to do? I need your help. Somebody yells out, don't desecrate Beethoven's concert hall with songs about black Americans. We don't want to hear it. And it's escalating. And God speaks. He said, sing this tune that was written by Beethoven. This is my piece. And he told his piano player, play, this is my piece. The guy didn't know it. So he picks out the melody, just kind of cries until he gets it right. Then he starts to add some chords, and then it starts to flow. He's got it down. He's up and down the keyboard. It's a beautiful composition. It's a rendition they'd never heard before, but they know it's Beethoven. And then the man starts to sing, This Is My Peace. When he finished that song, he had everybody's undivided attention in the place. Then they proceeded into their classical tunes that they had planned for him to do there. And then... Great leap of faith, he started singing the old Negro spirituals, which were in his heart. The crowd loved it. They went wild. When the concert ended, some of the men rushed the stage. They went up on the stage. They grabbed him. They held him up, put him on their shoulders, and paraded him around that whole concert hall. This was the beginning of the French and the Germans coming to peace. Something started when he sang, this is my peace. And he was a factor in bringing peace to both of those countries. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. As we go through the Beatitudes, there's a pattern here. There are eight things that God's given us. Some theologians say there's nine. I'm going to put the last two together for next week and do it as one. But again and again and again, it says, blessed are. Blessed literally means happy. It means enviable. It means you're feeling real good with God's best feelings. He would like for you to be happy. And he's telling you this is the way to be happy. If you don't do it God's way, you're going to be you're going to just be disappointed. How many times have you thought, if I just had this, I'd be happy? And it didn't last. If I just had this, I'd be happy. And it didn't last. If I just had this, I'd be happy. It doesn't last. Jesus is trying to tell us how we can develop happiness on the inside that's safe. It's not at risk. It can't be taken away from you. If your happiness is based on things outside of yourself, you are at risk. Jesus eight times says, blessed are and he tells us what to do. And then he gives us the benefit. Listen to this pattern. If you want to be blessed, you got to be poor in spirit. The benefit of that, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. When you mourn, you will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Well, those first four kind of get us into the kingdom of God. That's where we begin the relationship. And then it grows from there. We're coming up on the seventh rung today. So we look at this. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on talking about that last one we'll cover next week. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. When I used to go to my grandparents' house in Louisiana, or when I go to a family reunion, and I was growing up, people just needed to figure out how I looked like my parents. Oh, I think he favors his mom. Look, he's got his mother's nose. Oh, look, he's got his father's eyes. And they were just kind of trying. I never liked it. I didn't especially want to be like my parents. I didn't think they were that cool. But they were always trying to identify me with my parents. This is what this is about. When you're a peacemaker, people will see you like they see your father, who is God. You'll be called sons and daughters of God. We're going to look at three things today. For you to have the happiness, the internal happiness, the blessedness that comes from this, you have to first make peace with God. And then you've got to make peace with yourself. And then you've got to make peace with other people and for other people. We're going to break it down. This word for peace, is it comes from the root word of shalom. That's what they were talking about. This is a spiritual kind of peace. That's when everything with your soul is well. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. I often give you my psychological definition of peace. It's an absence of bad feelings. That's a good place to start. When you are at peace psychologically, you just don't have any bad feelings. There's no depression. There's no worry. There's no anxiety. There's no fear, no bitterness, no resentment, no unforgiveness. You just don't have any bad feelings. That's a good place. But when you're peacemakers, it's this spiritual peace where everything with your soul is well. It's a good, good thing to have. And he tells us to do it. We've got shalom, and this word for maker is somebody who does something, someone who takes action. So he's saying, hey, if you want to be happy, take action to be a peacemaker. So we start with God. I think it's so interesting. We had this beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see. God. I don't think that's necessarily talking about seeing God physically. He's mighty big. He holds the entire universe in the span of his hand. So when we think about that from a logical, rational perspective, this is a round planet. If we're on this side of it, we are unable to see the other side of it. And God's on both sides of it. We can't see all of him at once, but we can see him working in our lives. And the more you see him working in your life, the happier you're going to be, the more hope you're going to have, the better you're going to feel. It makes it good. Good. I saw God working this way. Interesting how things just fit together. And as you, as you try to do these things, you'll see more and more of God. Earlier in the week, I listened to Bill Johnson, who's one of my favorite speakers. And he said... I'm saying something to you today, house was packed. He said, I felt like God told me there's a scripture we're going to be talking about today. And it's going to set some of you free. It's going to set you free from your bondage and your captivity. Something supernatural is going to happen when you understand the scripture we're going to look at today. I thought that's interesting. I'd never heard him say that before. Well, let's see. That was last weekend. Then on Tuesday, I met with a friend I've not seen in five or six years. He's an internationally acclaimed prophet. He's the real deal. Crazy gifted. I mean, really crazy. I've seen him in action. He really hears from God. And we got near the end of our three-hour happy hour. We did a lot of catching up. And he said, I think the Spirit of the Lord has something for me to share with you. He pulled up his Bible on his phone, and he read to me from Ecclesiastes. I don't spend a lot of time in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I wasn't real familiar with this. But he gave me this verse, and 
New Testament prophecy, according to 1 Corinthians 14, is always to strengthen, to comfort, to build up, to encourage you. That's what it's supposed to do. This worked for me. He said, God wants you to know you have pleased him. And he read from Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 26. For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. He said, you have had people steal from you. You've had Satan steal from you. And they're collecting it, but God is going to restore. You're coming into a season of restoration where things that have been taken for you are going to be restored a thousandfold. Well, you know, that's probably a symbolic and a figurative number, but it felt good to me. Well, yesterday when I was working on Bible study, I felt like God said, look at the context of that. I was typing out what he'd said to me, hanging on to it. I looked at the rest of the chapter and I realized something. There are a lot of people who've been Christians most of their lives, and yet they're still not at peace with God. Now, Solomon had a good father, King David, a man after God's own heart, the guy who wrote most of the Psalms. Solomon had a relationship with God. God spoke to him in dreams. God gave him supernatural wisdom. They definitely had a relationship, but listen to where he ends up here. Chapter 2, verse 17 so I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me for all is vanity and a striving after the wind. There's a problem here. Think about how God describes himself in the Bible. God is love. God is light. God is life. Deuteronomy 30, 19 and 20. At the end of that verse, he says, for the Lord is your life. The Lord equals life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus equals life. If you're hating life and life is God, you're hating God too. That's not going to work well for you. I catch myself sometimes hating life. When I looked at the context as God told me to do, I thought, hmm, oops, I hadn't been doing too well for the last six months. I've kind of hated life. Life as I knew it was taken from me, wasn't my fault. I didn't blame God for it, but I just didn't like life. I, I'm tired of seeing doctors, having tests going to physical therapy, having my life disrupted, watching my client base disappear because I, I just haven't had the time to see people. It's just been something I have not enjoyed. But we read farther. We come to verse 20. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. This is what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, it was going through. He just came to hate life. He dropped into despair and he thought it's futile. I've worked so hard to do so much and suddenly it's just all gone. He was having a moment, you might say. I caught myself there. And he goes on, there's a solution. Verse 24, there's nothing better for a person than he, that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. That's kind of countercultural. 80% of Americans are not happy campers when it comes to their job. They don't like their jobs. 80%, eight out of 10. That's a lot. God says we could should enjoy our toil, our work. Fortunately, I have loved the last half of my career since I had my own ministry. I love what I do. I've never planned on retiring. I wanted to do it as long as I possibly could. 
let's just say it's been severely interrupted, but I think I'm on the way back up because this really spoke to me. I need to start enjoying life, enjoying work, enjoy everything that I'm doing. For to the one who pleases him, okay, let me go back 24. There's nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? So this is leading us to where we make peace with God. We're going to have to enjoy things, and it's God that makes it possible. If you're not enjoying your life, if you're not enjoying your work, if you're not enjoying your lifestyle, ask God to help you because it only comes through him. He's the one who gives us the ability to breathe, to swallow, to eat, to drink, to enjoy our toil. Then in chapter 3, he says it again. Verse 9, what gain has the worker from his toil? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything. It's a big word. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Verse 12, I perceive that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. So the first thing we got to do is make peace with God. We got to get right with him. If we're angry with him, if we're unhappy with life, we're not at peace with God. We need to get to that place. There was an American artist, Eric Sloan. Eric Sloan was very successful in his day. In fact, when he was a young man, he was painting signs. That was what he did. He liked to do art. He did graphics. He did the graphics for companies like Bull Durham, for Red Man Tobacco. He would do advertisements. He'd do billboards. He'd do pictures in magazines. He did that kind of art. Later in his life, he went to Taos. He painted landscapes. They sold for a lot of money. He was a very fine artist. But when he was a relatively young man, his dad died. And left him a million dollars back when a million dollars was really a lot of money. It only took him about a year to blow through all of that. And he woke up one Sunday morning and he realized all of his money was gone. And his father, who had really been a huge support and strength and friend to him, was gone. And he found himself in a very dark place. He didn't know what to do. He'd never been religious. He'd never spent much time in church. That's the only thing he could think of to do on a Sunday morning. He went to church. The preacher that day had a message about God's providence is your inheritance. This guy had never met this pastor. The pastor knew nothing about him. And the pastor talked about it doesn't matter how bankrupt you are. It doesn't matter how much you've lost. It doesn't matter how far down you've gone. If you'll trust God with your whole life and let him be Lord of your life, then God's providence will become your inheritance. This really picked the guy up. He went home. He went to his easel. He pulled out his paintbrush, his paint, and he painted on the bottom of his easel where you'd see it every day that God's providence is my inheritance and he got after it he became so successful he was well known he was written up he became an author he wrote books about art and his last book he wrote was his memoirs the name of his memoirs was 80 an american souvenir i wonder if i think of myself as an american souvenir when i'm 80 years old if i make it that far He's 80 years old. He's walking down the sidewalks of New York. He's going to a luncheon that is in his honor 
they're going to celebrate that his book, 80, An American Souvenir, has just been released. On his way to the party to honor and celebrate him, he has a heart attack. He grabs a, a, a parking meter, hangs on it. Somebody saw he was in trouble. They tried to get help, but he was gone. I'd kind of like to go that way. On the way to a party for me, and boom, God takes you out to a much bigger party in heaven. But this is how you make peace with God. He had that experience. He thought, okay, if God's providence is my inheritance, I'm going to make the most of it. Make peace with God. The next thing is to make peace with yourself. We get some very clear instructions in Philippians 4 about making peace with yourself. This is so good. We could, we could spend the next three months in Philippians 4, but we're going to rip through it real fast, starting in verse 4. This is how you can make peace with yourself. And you will need to make peace with yourself on a daily basis. Do you ever have trouble with yourself? Do you ever in, not enjoy being with yourself? I remember a long time ago, one of my friends said, yeah, yeah, we're just going out to really enjoy ourselves. That just struck me wrong. I've been trained that we were not supposed to enjoy ourselves. We're supposed to work hard, but to enjoy yourself. Isn't that a little bit arrogant? Isn't that a little bit prideful? It struck me wrong. I was wrong. We should because we are God's creation, created in his image. There's a lot to celebrate ourselves, but we often forget who we are. We lose our identity in Christ. Do you know who you are in Christ? You're a child of the king. You're a child of the owner, the creator of the universe. You were created by God, and he doesn't ever make mistakes. You were purchased by God. You were adopted by God. He saw you fit to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. He saw fit to make you the body of Christ. You are somebody in God's sight. You're a big deal. Scripture says he rejoices over you with singing. He's excited about you because he sees the bigger picture. He knows why he made you. He knows what you, he made you for. And as you find your purpose, as you slide into those things, it gets a whole lot easier to enjoy your toil, to celebrate your toil, because you're doing what God created you to do. And when you get off track, this is how to get back. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Realize you are in God. And he is in you. And you can't be separated. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So that's something to rejoice in. And as you make peace with yourself, in the book of James, we'll take a quick look. First chapter, verse 2. Now, these are things that when you're not at peace with yourself, when you've made a mistake, when you look at life, when you think, I haven't done enough, I've wasted my life, life's over, the best is behind me, it's going to go downhill from here. When you're not at peace with yourself, this is something to do. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. Now keep in mind, when you're steadfast, you're at peace with yourself. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. People work all of their lives to get to the place, hopefully to get to the place, where they haven't enjoyed their toil for their 40-year career, but hopefully they saved up enough money that they can sit home and die. And 
they're hoping that they will lack nothing, but most people lack a lot. They don't know how they're going to make it. They don't know what's going to happen with them. Well, when you're steadfast and you're perfect and you're complete and you're lacking in nothing, you're going to be at great peace with yourself. When you lack nothing, you lack not for love. You lack not for joy. You lack not for peace. All of your needs are satisfied. Your desires are fulfilled. When you're living according to the Beatitudes, you'll be blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed. You have the kingdom. You'll have the earth. You'll have mercy. You'll have satisfaction. You'll be called sons of God. You'll see God. Life is really good. This is how you get back to that place is you rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. That's quite a challenge. Can you make it through the next 30 seconds without being anxious about something? Can you? Can you go for a minute? Can you learn to stretch that into half an hour, maybe an hour? But it's a worthy goal, and it's a matter of obedience. Be anxious for nothing, and here's what you can do instead. instead. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. As I listen to Bill Johnson, he said that prayerlessness creates lack. I, I didn't accept that at first, but he kept talking. He said, when you don't pray, it creates lack in your life. Now, this is talking about prayer. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, talking to God. He said in James, it says you do not have because you do not ask. This convicted me. I have not been asking God for enough. I've been hoping, but I haven't been asking. There's a difference. There is a difference. And I've started asking. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open to you, because everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, the door will be open unto him. Because you have a good father. If a child asks his good father for a piece of bread, the father's not going to give him a stone that he's going to break his teeth on. If he asks for a piece of fish, his father's not going to give him a serpent that's going to bite him. Our Father in heaven gives us good gifts. Every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And we just need to ask more. Now, if you will do this, if you rejoice and rejoice and ask through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you get the prize. Here's the prize. This is how you make peace with yourself. Verse 7, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which makes no sense. You can be broke. You can be sick. You can be going through a divorce. You can have your car repossessed. All your friends turn on you, and you can still be at peace. That is the peace that transcends all understanding. It's the sense that doesn't even make sense. It's important. It's very important that you learn how to access this peace of God that transcends all understanding because it guards your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It's a big deal. This is how you make peace with yourself. And it makes a huge, huge, huge difference in your life. In Hebrews 12, 14, we got to look at something. It says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now we're back to seeing God. How do you see God? We talk about that. You see God 
when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You'll see God. We don't see God unless we strive for peace, and we don't see God unless we strive for that holiness, that set-apartness. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many may be defiled. In Matthew 10, 34, we see Jesus say something that sounds like a contradiction. He told us that we'd be blessed if we're the peacemakers. And then he says in 1034, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not love son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake. We'll find it. So Jesus tells us we'll be blessed if we're peacemakers. Now see, when he said this, when he was talking about peacemakers, he's talking about the future. You will be. He's telling us what's coming. He had not finished his work yet. But you watch how Jesus was a peacemaker. It was always centered around the righteousness of God. He really stirred up the scribes and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees, they didn't want peace to be made with him. He was a peacemaker. He reconciled man to God. He made that possible. He brought peace into the lives of many people he came across. He rescued. He healed them. He kept them from being stoned to death. He fed them when they were hungry. He brought a lot of peace to a lot of people as he go, but he never compromised the values of God. It gets messy when you're a peacemaker. Because when you get between opposing people, sometimes there will be some ripples. There will be some tough times. And he always made peace based on the word of God and God's principles and values. We're going to look at our last verse of Scripture today in Isaiah 58, verse 12. This is about making peace with God, with yourself, and then with other people. Verse 12, this is significant. Robert Schuler, on the day that he was ordained to the gospel ministry, got up early that morning, was having his daily quiet time, was reading his Bible, and somehow that day he was in Isaiah 58. And he, when he read this verse, he realized this is what God has called me and my ministry to. Well, I think it worked well for him. He was one of the foremost positive thinkers. He was inspirational. He created the Crystal Cathedral. He brought lots of people to Christ. He spoke to millions of people every week on the radio and on television for decades. He made a huge difference. This is what this one verse of Scripture said. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. So when we come to other people and we see a breach, we need to get involved. We need to repair the breaches between God and people, between people and people, between ourselves, with ourselves, ourselves with God. But we need, when we see a breach, a broken relationship, we need to be the one who repairs breach, following God's standards. There was a guy, got to look at his name real quick, before my time. It was S. Truett Cathy. You've probably heard of him. He was the founder of Chick-fil-A. He started that in Georgia. He found a way to make chicken sandwiches just as fast as you could make a hamburger. And that was a new thing, and it made good chicken sandwiches. He's, it's still in business today. He's long gone. But in Atlanta, a big city, there were two major newspapers. And these newspapers were very different. One was conservative. One was liberal. 
the owners of these papers hated each other. It was a public hatred match. It's the kind of thing you'd see on social media all the time of how much these people hated each other if social media had been around them. Well, this man, Mr. Kathy, who had Chick-fil-A, invited both of these newspaper owners to come have lunch with him. And he didn't tell them that he invited both of them at the same time. He didn't tell them he'd invited the other one. So they show up at his restaurant at the same time. He lured them in. He called and invited them. Would you come have lunch as my guest? I'd like to talk to you about taking out a full page advertisement in your newspaper. That's big money. That's the kind of thing an owner of a newspaper will go have lunch and a chicken sandwich to get a piece of. They were hoping for that. They come, they think in this. And when they got there, he said, I know you know each other. I have a proposition for both of you. If you'll sit at that table over there, at the same table, eat a chicken sandwich that will be my gift to you. And after you've eaten the sandwich, shake hands with each other. Let us take your picture. We're going to put a caption in the newspaper under it that said, even if we can't agree on anything, we can agree that this is the best chicken sandwich we've ever had in our lives. And they agreed to it. This was his effort to bring them to the table, to break bread and chicken together. And it didn't make real lasting peace, but it was his effort to try to heal a breach. He was trying to be the repairer of the breach. So this is quite a challenge, but God says, if you will be a peacemaker, you're going to be blessed and people will see God in you. They'll see the resemblance with you and God. I'm going to wrap it up with this. Hubert Humphrey was just nearly before my time. I didn't care about politics back then. He ran for president. He was vice president of the United States of America for four years. He was a senator for 17 years before that. Before that, he was a college professor and taught political science. Uh, and he was always trying to make peace. I was shocked at some of the accomplishments he had. He was the one that got Medicare started. He had a lot to do with the civil rights amendments they made. He did a lot of good for a lot of people. He breached the gap between the races, between the political parties, between different countries. And in his latter years, when he was getting old and his health was failing him, his family thought, you really ought to go back to Washington for one last hurrah. You've still got lots of friends there. They would love to see you. Why don't you go? And he said, you know, I'd just rather sit around at home in Minnesota and really not do anything. And, and a friend called and talked to him. And as they are talking, the friend just kind of baited him and said, you know, I know you've been through some really stormy times in life. When you got there, what did you do? How did you get out of those times? And he told him some stories about what deep weeds he'd been in and how depressed he'd been, and how he talked himself out of it, how he worked himself out of it. And after that conversation of hearing himself say some pretty good things, he decided maybe I should have a last hurrah. He told his wife, she passed the word on, Jimmy Carter was president at the time. As he was flying over Minnesota one day on his way back to Washington, he landed Air Force One, picked up Hubert Humphrey, took him to Washington on Air Force One to celebrate him, to have that last hurrah. When he got there, he talked to the friend on the phone that had kind of put him up to this, that convinced him he should go. He said, by the way, I know what you were doing. I know how you did it, but it worked, and thank you, and I'm glad I'm here. It's really fun to see some old friends, and I don't know how many days left, but it's good to be able to do this. So he did that. While they're on the phone, the friend says to him, you may be the most applauded man in the country right now. And he humbly responded, well, that's possible. And he said, and I also know someone else who lives 20 minutes away from me. 
who is totally ostracized. He's pretty much been exiled. His name's Richard Nixon. Do you think there's any hope that he could ever be forgiven? That this country could ever forgive him? Do you think it's possible? And they had this conversation of what would have to happen. Well, he would have to show up at a very prestigious, very highly publicized event. He would have to be invited by somebody who was well-loved and highly respected. And whoever invited him who was well-loved and highly respected couldn't be anybody who's ever going to run for public office because that would definitely be used against them in a political campaign. And they continued this conversation. He finally said to his friend, I guess I'm that man. I will see to it that Richard Nixon is invited to my funeral. Now, I hadn't mentioned yet, he and Richard Nixon ran against each other for the president of the United States. And near the end, it got to be a very, very tight race. The popular vote barely went to Nixon, and he won soundly in the electoral college. But here's a man who had defeated Hubert Humphrey for president of the United States, and then he'd blown it. But Hubert Humphrey was that kind of guy. He was willing to step up, try to redeem this man. When he died, his body was lying in state in the Capitol building. His wife was seated as people walked by to pay their respects, thousands of thousands of people coming, being there. She's sitting with her family on one side and Richard Nixon on the other. And somebody said, why in the world is Nixon here? He doesn't deserve to be here. How did he get invited? And somebody said to him, if you knew who Hubert Humphrey was, you would not be asking that question. He was a peacemaker. God calls us to make peace with him, to ourselves, and everywhere we go. You're going to have opportunities to make peace today. And as you do, you'll be blessed, and it's going to cause you to be called sons and daughters of God.